scenario today was something a slightly different than, than mo most of the talks that, that, that have, are being presented, driving a bit away from the idea of um, basically computers being used only as, as a matter of privacy, as a matter of uh, data, as a matter of, you know, like basically how do you keep your information from being read or used for different purposes, and driving a bit more of the conversation to how these flows of information actually can also impact in the physical world. So those of you that are familiar with the terms uh, industrial control systems, operational technologies, cyber physical, things like that, you might know already where this is going. And well, the point is also to share a bit of, um, of the stories. I, I don't want to bore you only with the theory of what could happen, uh, some ideas, but actually things that have already happened, things that we see in the like, like threat intelligence community. And also uh, talk to you from a different perspective of, of threat intelligence as, as an outsider. So to start this, actually, I thought talking about a bit about personal experience, but in a, in a way that probably is not expected to, to be seen in here, which is by talking about where I come from. Um, the place where I come from is actually Mexico. So probably you, you could have guessed with some, some of this, maybe somewhere in Latin America. And what it's not about this country, well, the country is well known for food, is well known for uh, happiness, is well known for parties, is well known for uh, culture, a lot of history, but it is not known for playing a huge role in geopolitical games, you know, in, in terms of conflict, in terms of defining what happens in different regions and whatnot. So coming from this background and from, from this type of understanding of the world, you can imagine that it was a very big switch when I move into this world. Um, after my time in Mexico, growing, blah, blah, and careers, I ended up moving to the United States, studying some time in there, whatever, and eventually got hired for, for a, a role in threat intelligence community, particularly cyber threat intelligence, in uh, the area from Washington, D.C., where you know a lot of the decisions that happen impact the world in, in different ways. They know much more about, there's much more of this culture uh, surrounding like, like geopolitics, how are we going to influence what's, what's happening in different places, how those things are influencing us, and generally thinking about the world from a very different vision. And within that, that background, uh, you can get even more specific, which is when you start thinking about precisely their intelligence. As threat intelligence, I mean, all of the ones in here know, know already some, some of it, you, you're pretty much surely familiar, but when you talk with someone outside, like just in the street, and it's like, what do you do? And you say like, oh, threat intelligence, and they're like, whoa, can you even talk about it? Like, yeah, yeah, of course we can, because threat intelligence has evolved in such a unique way that maybe many years ago it was what we saw in the movies, you know, like the guy with the hat and super secret, and, uh, but recently it's something that also multiple organizations have to do uh, you know, like from the private sector, from, from uh, non-government organizations. Basically, there's a lot much more going on in the threat intelligence world. And uh, that is basically how we ended up getting uh, this type of information, trying to help uh, different organizations, different countries, people in general to remain safe, uh, to remain private, and, and, and whatnot. So that being said, threat intelligence is not the only interesting thing in here, but also that the time we are living in is quite particular. These are a series of things that I pulled from Twitter, that are just, just random, that I find interesting. Um, describing what, it's not an official term, but I, I always say like, like it's, it's kind of like being in another, uh, another Cold War, right? Where you're seeing different states aligning between themselves, basically, uh, trying to push different narratives, engaging on disinformation, engaging on espionage, and shading on cyber attacks, uh, different types, you know, and, and in, in, including the, the physical, which I'm going to be switching to in a second. And actually, what you see here is, is very interesting. It's, I mean, I've, it is fun in a, in a horrible way, but basically, the ones from below are basically the responses that permanently happen between the Twitter of Ukraine and the official Twitter in Russia. And basically, they're making these type of jokes permanently. The one on the left, we see uh, it's, it's from a Russian account saying, like, what NATO is saying is false, you know, like, like a funny bear. Uh, these are the hackers. 
And from the United States, uh, we have this, for example, from the US Cyber Command, where what they are doing is exposing uh, specific campaigns, uh, specific tools that they, are, that they are running into, and making some sort of, of a parody, right? So what you see is these flows of information that are, are, are telling us there is something going on. We are permanently having these type of clashes. And even though on Twitter it's very fun and we share them and we, you know, we enjoy them, the problem is that there are much bigger implications. And those bigger implications are precisely when you discuss in terms of the evolution of what we considered from, from cybersecurity. Many years ago, when you thought about a computer, you were permanently thinking about the privacy. And, and Nancy, well, it's not only privacy, but basically privacy, integrity, availability, data, you know, no one should get access. Uh, if you, they get access to, uh, I don't know, like your personal information, what can they do, their, their, the information from your organization, whatnot. But actually, right now, what we're seeing more uh, that I believe is a concern that we should be raising more in these communities is the switch towards safety. Safety parenthesis, the parenthesis is a term that does not exist in every language. Uh, for example, just particularly in Spanish, we say seguridad, which means security, period. Seguridad is everything. In English, they have this separation, for example, safety, security. And the reason to make this differentiation is security means, yeah, when, when there is uh, someone that you know, try, tries to, uh, to attack to basically generate something, something negative, some negative input. But particularly in safety, it matters when it's basically the, the main thing we care about when we see it from an engineering perspective, from a process that, that means more like there could be a physical damage to your process, to your person, uh, to your infrastructure. And so to illustrate, like, like at, 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 to begin, like, like this illustration of, of what is going on, I have this quick timeline. Uh, this timeline is mainly focused on on big incidents, like, like the ones that catch a lot of attention, take years to, to study. And then we added a bit of, of like why it's going more dramatic recently. I'm going to be talking of the three things. Mm, so, so the first one, Stuxnet. Is everyone here familiar with, with Stuxnet? Uh, can you raise your hand if you, if you know what it is? OK, so, so basically, it seems like most, most people are, are familiar. For those that didn't raise a hand, it's just a super summary. Uh, an attack against an Iranian nuclear centrifuges. Uh, both uh, seem to be state-sponsored and, and, and whatnot, and will basically delay the program for, for a, a long time after they, they manage to impact the centrifuges and delay the process for, for years. Then we have uh, this, I'm, I'm just going to summarize, with 2011 through 2016, it's an era where you see more researchers disclosing vulnerabilities. You start seeing some different types of attacks. You see a couple of power outages in Ukraine, for example, where basically they, they turn off the light for a couple hours, some using very complex tools, some using less complex ones. And then eventually we get to 2017. This is the case, one of the cases that I'm going to be talking more about. Um, I realize that, for example, most people, when, when talk about control systems and this type of security, they think of Stuxnet. But in my opinion, Triton is the most interesting. Question, could you raise your hand if you're familiar with Triton? A couple. OK. Well, that is great, because I'm going to be giving a more of a description of that one. That, that's actually also like, like from, from basically from the back ends of what, what we saw and how, how it took place. But so basically, that, that's one of the most relevant incidents on, 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 from my perspective. Then we get to 2019, and those are other two things that I'm going to be covering that is moving from the, the perspective of it has to be a nation state to actually we care about criminals because criminals are, are generating the same or similar impacts. And then we care also about uh, basically random people. It can be a hacktivist, it can be a, a per, an individual a hacker, it can be a small group of individuals that decide that they want to explore this type of, of, um, of attacks. And then finally, 2022, just because it's the newest, probably they will mention something in the next panel about Ukraine. There was industry version two, basically reuse of tools from 2016 to try to turn off multiple uh, energy uh, facilities in, in Ukraine. Gladly, it was stopped as, as much as we can, as, as we can tell. And uh, in controller, which is a big set of tools, not necessarily related to Ukraine, but disclosed around the same time, particularly to impact a couple sets of, uh, of control systems. I'm, I'm going to briefly mention both of those. So, to jump into this anthology, how, how I call it, of tales, um, I will separate it in three parts. Let's go to the first one, which is the nation state one. For the nation state one, the first thing to mention here is 
this quote, which I, I love from, uh, from a report from Siemens a couple of years ago. What they were doing is they were reporting about cybersecurity for oil and gas, and they were saying, you know, come with us, our products are, are, are good, you know, uh, we are trying, we're focused on security. And then what they highlighted was uh, how organizations in specific sectors are being in the crossfire of different organizations that are trying to impact each other. So what you see is a ton of organizations doing a lot of espionage. Um, then you see that a couple of cyber attacks, the couple of big ones that you saw. And the reason why this is so important is because all of this espionage that they do, gather information about the processes, how do you generate the, uh, your, your product, how do you share your product, what type of network do you have, what type of engineering background do you have, uh, basically who is the people working for you, all of that you need it when you want to go and attack something as not simple as this. And so, having that background, we can go to the first story time, which is Triton, precisely, the one I was mentioning. In a nutshell, what Triton is, is uh, basically a state-sponsored attack against an um, energy facility in the Middle East. Happened in 2017, but took at least since, well, the first time we, we, we were able to track activity was back to 2014. Um, and what was the most interesting thing in this case uh, is, is basically how it happened is all of a sudden, uh, Mandiant, uh, they reach out to, to, to our organization and they say, hey, you know, we need your help for, for a response to this incident. Something's happening in the, in the, in the facility. It's turning off. Uh, they go, they start checking, and then they, they find this super complex uh, situation where the most unique thing was not the full attack, the full cyber attack, the, the full cycle, but actually the last step that it was a very complicated, very sophisticated piece of malware that was specifically trying to target something that I hope, well, probably no one has heard about. Has anyone here heard about the Triconix safety instrumented system? Two people, great. Well, Triconix safety instrumented system is basically the last line of defense in terms of safety. It's basically once that you modify a process, that you figure out how to modify the process, and then you want to turn off this, this second alarm that, that says, you know, uh, something's going on, just turn off because, you know, otherwise there's going to be an accident. Well, that is what the safety controller does. And then the attacker was already compromising the safety controller, which means they had everything they needed to go all the way through, a, through basically, a, a, I call it physical attack, but basically destruction. So give an idea of how the attack looks like, because I know that beyond, uh, you know, to go a bit beyond uh, just, just the anecdotal perspective, but like the sophistication of the attack. What you see up on there is basically, yeah, well, well, the attacker came up from uh, IT. Basically, this is how we understand from, from the control systems, operational technology. We understand the world using this diag diagram-ish that's called a Purdue model. And it shows, basically, that's the corporate network where most of the computers are. Then you start getting more specific. There's a, the military zone that separates the, your control systems from, from IT world. And then you get this uh, distributed control system, controls the process, finally, this safety instrumented system. What's very interesting here is that the attacker was able to go all through that process. And how they were doing it was actually very interesting because the person that was trying to do this series of compromises using tools that are known, others that are not known, making small modifications, they were testing the tools in, in known uh, malware analysis uh, sandboxes. And then they would test the tool, they would deploy. If you know, there, a certain number of antivirus organizations caught it, then they would continue testing. And when they finally got a zero detection, they go and they deploy. And that is how little by little over this period of long period of time, eventually, they get all the way to the safety instrumented system. And there, there's a very different story about someone who somehow developed this very sophisticated malware for targeting a type of controller that actually, if you want to get access to one, now we know you can do it probably from eBay, buy an old one, <laughs> but normally it's, it's not, not something you can get access to. And there is no public information about the protocol, no public information about how to work with these devices. It's fairly specific. So the three use cases for here, the reason why this was so concerning is because we started analyzing, you have like everything that happens, and then you say, what is it that they want to do with all of this? And there were three possible alternatives, none of which sounded very happy. The first one was, I just stopped the process. Because if I trigger one of the, of the alerts from the safety instrumented system, it's going to say, 
A, there's something wrong with the process. Let's stop. I don't want to blow up. Cool. OK, that, that's the easiest. The second one is I'm going to reprogram it so that it, like, like the plant can go to an unsafe state. So let's say that if I don't want ever my process to get to, I don't know, 50 degrees, then I'm going to reprogram it so that it allows up to 60 degrees. So that if in the future I want to come back and I want to make a modification, the safety controller is not going to trigger, and then the plant is again going to end up in a bad situation. And then the last one, which is the most aggressive, is you have all the access to the, the network, you have all, all the process, you have been, you basically own the, the, the network from the organization. So what you could do is actually uh, you reprogram the SIS so that it can be unsafe, and also you modify from the control system, the distributed control system, how, how we call it, basically just basically how, how you're, you're interacting with the process, you modify the process, so you bring it to this unsafe state, so you force this type of uh, physical attack. And so, I know some people don't like attribution, some people do, there are multiple reasons. On my perspective, attribution more than uh, a specific state, it means basically that, that you can group the indicators and have a technical understanding of the author. But in this case, the reason why I bring it up is because it was a very interesting case, normally, uh, it is a bit more, well, it is always difficult to, to do this type of work, but in this case, there were some mistakes from the actor that were the ones that allowed the researchers to actually go and figure out what happened. I'm going to mention the specific mistakes, but basically the attack was attributed to a nation state uh, sponsored laboratory, even, you know, going back to a specific location and whatnot. And to do this, we had to do all this crazy work. I'm actually just going to step in directly. Uh, this is how it looks like if we wanted to do the equivalent of those pin maps, you know, like how you like 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 the meme that you just like What is all this? It makes no sense. Well, basically there were three lines that we used to get this attribution uh, There's full talks about this, but right now I'm just gonna give the summarized version basically one IP address uh, that wasn't really really masked it was directly registered for the organization that was used to connect to multiple other organizations suffering in similar type of industries, which was used to go and look at our blog posts every time we were, we, were, um, we were publishing, which was also used to deploy the actual attack, and was also used by this mysterious person. Uh, this mysterious person is uh, someone that was involved in doing this testing with the sandboxes, and one day by mistake they left a very unique uh, handle in, in a PDB path. And then based on that very unique handle uh, from the path, then we were able to identify uh, where the individual was coming from, what it was, whatever. That's, that's where you stop as, an, as a private organization. You know, it, it becomes a work from someone else. But then you were able to connect the fact that, yes, uh, the, this is who's doing it. Uh, this is where it's coming from. And then you connect with other more opportunist, not opportunistic, less high quality indicators, like basically the languages that are being used and when the activity is taking place. Based on all of that, we were able to connect where it was coming from and, uh, well, basically make the assessment of, yeah, to make, it's a no brainer that to make something so complicated, you need resources, you need a big team and you need to have them working permanently. So knowing all the details might take years or maybe are never gonna be all, all known, but at least this gave a picture of what it was. And just, I mean, of course, this was uh, gladly verified some, some years later. Actually, this is, I believe, uh, from yeah, earlier this year. Uh, basically, just the Department of Justice in the US uh, issued a, an indictment for some of the individuals involved in, in this and other activity. Uh, basically, Triton was one of the big, of the big reasons why they, they were able to push this. And well, I mean, it's just, just good to see how the full story closed in, a, in basically, the, the, the full circle was closed. Now, that is, in my opinion, probably the most impactful in, in terms of like, it is very obvious that you see the, um, well, okay, um, that you see that there was this intentionality for, you know, physical attack, that they did something super complex, that there are resources getting in place into trying to do these attacks, such as they happened before in Sugnets and this one, in, you know, in different ones, right? But then the hot news that I was mentioning were the 2022 cases. Uh, it just continues happening, which is the reason why I believe this is more important right now than ever to start bringing into discussion and to start trying to get more people involved into. Um, because yeah, we, we saw fairly similarly complicated cases. The case you see in there in controller is a full diagram of the, the attack never took place. It's, it's a set of tools. 
um, and we, when we got visibility into that set of tools, we decided to place how it would look like in the full attack lifecycle. And then this is a full module that targets a very specific, again, a very specific company, very specific controllers, very specific processes. Same for this one. Um, this one is uh, Omron, for those that are familiar. That one was uh, Schneider Electric. And then this is for OPC UA, uh, which is basically a protocol that we use to communicate all the process data. Uh, but then when you put all that together, it, these, these tools actually gave you like, like the full capability of doing a similar attack more simple than Triton, but actually very beautifully written in such a way that I'm pretty sure whomever was doing it wanted to do something like this, which is, um, this is just a module from old malware that was deployed in Ukraine, trying to uh, turn off uh, the lights during the beginning of the conflict. And then what's very interesting here is uh, they, when they deploy this tool, it, it basically communicates with a very specific protocol. And what they do in here is they go and modify uh, specifically some processes. They modify the IP addresses, which mean that they already know at least some about the target and where they're going to go. And then they try to deploy and then hopefully turn off the power. And I repeat, it didn't happen, but we got a couple of samples in here. And that's basically, well, literally a couple. We got one and there is a public one in case you're curious about, about this malware. And so. That is all from the nation state perspective. I think that's, that's the most serious, the most concerning. I'll get back to discussing that just like from a high level. But I prefer to begin with that just because it's, it's kind of like, like a bit low, lower in, uh, yeah, I know that it's kind of like a very serious topic. So I wanted to jump to show that it is actually more simple than what we're just seeing. And even though nation states are involved in that and it's already complicated, there are more people who can do it. And so this is the story from uh, particularly criminals, the, main, the, the first time we started thinking about it was ransomware, and you're going to be more familiar probably with these stories, but now I'm going to tell them just from a different perspective so that you see the implications and how they were analyzed for people in the, the OT space. The first time we ever heard about this is, I know the ransomware is, goes, goes even beyond this, much beyond this, but the first time that we cared was during the WannaCry, then NotPetya, and then, you know. And the reason why we, we, we cared is because for the first time we saw industrial organizations, uh, I say industrial, but in this case, for example, you might be familiar with the big case of Maersk, uh, you know, the, I don't say basically cargo shipping and whatnot. And basically what happened with this type of ransomware is, you know, it was deployed, it started spreading everywhere, and then they realized that since they are now using more computers to coordinate all of these processes, physical and non-physical, then basically nothing was working and then you can't get the trucks in and then you can get them out and then you cannot load the cargo and then you cannot know what is in each container and, and you know like it made a very big impact it was millions and millions and millions and beyond that basically a bit of course you can't you can support uh, the service of, of transferring these goods but then this was just an isolated case and normally ransomware wasn't really wasn't really in our radar it was like oh it matters, and some people will be like, ah, it's boring. Everyone knows it. It's, it, it's simple. But then we started seeing something different, um, and then it's what this evolution that, that, that's known as, well, it's known as post-compromise ransomware by, by Mandiant. I think Microsoft refers to it as uh, targeted malware, or something like that. Sorry, targeted ransomware. There are different names, but basically... What we saw is when actors started doing something more, more, more involvement, right? That, that the actor itself uh, does engage in the full process, and it's not something just like a worm that it's going to be spreading and seeing what it can destroy, but actually that there's an actor that knows that the most they can damage the process, the most they can make life difficult for the victim, then the most likely they're going to win. And uh, the first time, well, one of the first times when we saw an organization come out publicly with this, it was Norsk Hydro. They were super vociferous, I might be inventing a word, but basically they were super clear about this in, in media and whatnot. So they decided to go fully and say, yes, we had an attack. This is what happened. And what happened was mainly uh, that it impacted some of their databases. And since they, they produce aluminum, but it goes all over the world, uh, it's a ton, it's gigantic. They don't know where the pieces are. They don't know how to continue. And since they lost all this information about customers, who's paid, what are they paying for, what are they ordering, where is it going? and all of this is connected with the actual physical process, then basically they were lost and they were like, okay, well, right now we can produce, we're going to have a very hard time. And well, that's basically what happened. It, it, was, it was another very big case. 
And from here, basically, this is what we are going to be continuing to see. Uh, this is nothing that, that happened once or twice. It's something that is happening every time more often. And we see it in the news. We read there was this new ransomware. And then probably from our perspective, it means like, well, yeah, just one more. It's terrible. But actually, the impact that it can have and that it is having, it's much larger. And mainly when you actually combine it also with, with you know, strategic techniques, like, like, in, like in the beginning, you know, like, like with the geopolitics of it. Um, so another case, Maritime Advisory, again, they were starting to learn that this was possible. Still, like, like it, it took years. The reason why I'm bringing this up as, as in years is because even though there are many cases, it took years for people in this engineering and, and OT type of community to accept that this was actually a threat. And it's, it's no wonder, because it's two separate worlds that have been getting you know, much closer together. But you know, up until now, it was something like, you know, it's not going to affect me, just computers. And then this maritime advisory, what it was saying is, again, there was another case. Uh, we can't get access, basically, an entirely different case. It's just like access to the, to, to the ports is, is, is impossible. Uh, so the process is getting very difficult. Again, we cannot go. We cannot uh, continue with our production. And you can see many different cases, of course. You can see uh, this is a very random one, Johannesburg City Power, basically uh, energy for customers. All of a sudden, you cannot receive energy because they decided to drop the ransomware on the date when you have to pay. And then if you can't pay, you don't receive energy. And your payment is automated via your service. And there is no service. So basically, you can't pay, so you lose your energy, and the organization didn't know what to do. Another example, uh, Prosegur, this was, uh, it's a security, uh, blah, 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 security type of appliances. Alarms, basically, again, your alarms turn off, nothing you can do about it, it affected multiple customers. This is just to show like, like the different types of impacts, you know, like, like it, it can be as big as lack of energy, it can be lack of water, it can be, uh, in these cases, you know, something like you can't pay, it can be, but, but in the end, it's having an impact in, in your daily life. And the bigger one, probably these are the last series I have for ransomware, is uh, the Colonial Pipeline. It was 2021, that's when they accepted and they said, yes, right now I have to do something. Everyone go and look for ransomware. And this was basically oil and gas distribution in, in US. The attack didn't actually impact OT or you know, like production systems, but what it actually did was you know, it was, it was in such a way that, that the organization and the incident responders and whatnot considered that it was a good idea to stop the process temporarily to make sure that nothing was going to spread. Uh, because if it was to spread into the control system, the impact would be much more massive. It could be a lot of time that users would not get access to, to gas. This, this was a big impact in the US because in the area where this organization was operating, uh, well, yeah, there, there was basically gas shortages for a period of time. And e even though this is a United States case, you know, I mean, it could be as, as, as simple. Earlier this year, there were some cases here uh, in, in ports in Europe, which, which is like, from a theoretical perspective, you analyze that you have some of the biggest ports in, in this uh, similar area where you have, for example, Hamburg. You drop two or three ports from there, and, you know, sharing things, you know, communicating is going to be super difficult. Anyway, but just to keep the, the notes a bit higher, I'm just going to say, it, it has gotten worse when they mess up with your beer. That's something that we normally do not consider appropriate. And also here, uh, there was this case, Backer log log Logistique. Uh, and basically, you know, we, we couldn't get cheese in Albertheim. So those of you that are from here, you might understand the trauma. Um, and it was basically because they could not uh, continue with this, uh, the distribution of the cheese for, for a couple of weeks. But anyway, those are more, more like on, on a happy note. But all of these, the point is, it's not uh, a couple cases. We're talking about thousands. Uh, what we did for this experiment, which is actually interesting, is it does not depend on the visibility of an organization. But what it actually depends on is we went directly to the ransomware uh, shaming sites, where they go and they drop the leaks after compromising the organization. And then we gather all that information, and then that's how we generate this, these numbers. We filtered specifically for industries that we consider that might be using this type of physical processes. And then that's how we got to this number of 2021, around 13, uh, 1,300. Of course, we continue seeing more. 2022 has been the same or bigger or larger surprise. And also we highlight that you know, it's not only like small companies, because some people believe, well, if you're small and you don't have budget for security, of course you're going to get popped. 
But actually, there's also some very large ones here. I mean, well, this is above 1,000, above 10,000 employees. Uh, basically, you, you know, all type of organizations are the ones that are being impacted by, by this type of, of, of activity. But this is fine. I, if anyone went to my other talk, you already saw this. I, I just love it too much. Uh, the author gave me allowed to use this in, in, uh, in this type of environment. But uh, yeah, the point is, 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 I mean, of course, this is terrible. Um, but yeah, I mean, all of us are dealing with that. And, and the point in here is just to bring up about this additional implication that we have from the physical world as to see how we can work together to see how you can solve it from a physical and from an IT perspective. All of this, uh, I think I should have placed this earlier, but the point is just uh, the reason why it's getting so complicated as well, if, uh, for those that are not as, as, as into the, this specific world, is how it's getting more complex for, for all of these groups. Um, basically, the fact is that you don't have a single individual or a single group doing it, this type of ransomware deployment anymore, but rather different cells. Uh, it might be some people doing initial access, offering it, selling it, distributing. Uh, someone else develops this panel so that you can go and charge for the money and communicate with the victim. Some other group might be doing moving across organization network using the same techniques that the nation state actors used for deploying Triton or whatnot. So that is actually another big point that if you can see what these actors are able to do right now, well, it should be a big alert because they're super close uh, to the point where they can generate again willingly or unwillingly the type of impact that we don't want in the physical world. But that is all from, from ransomware. Again, I'm going to go another layer a bit more, more simple, uh, just you know, to go from the, from the worst to a place where we can chill a bit. And so I have a couple more stories. These ones go on the, on the layer of other type of actors, not nation states, uh, not, not organized criminals. Just a random individual. It could be any one of us in here. It could be our friends. It could be our acquaintances. Hopefully not, but it could. Um, and then we have this, uh, what we call low sophistication type of attacks. This one is interesting because it happened a couple, a couple weeks ago. And basically, it was uh, apparently this, this actor claimed on Twitter to have popped this uh, Iranian uh, steel production facility. They shared some videos. That's actually, if, if you go, you can find it probably, I don't know if they took it down, but for a while it was there. Uh, and then that's a video of what the impact happened actually in the, in the facility. Here, there are some uh, machine interfaces of how you interact actually with the process. And they, they, the point in here was to say like, hey, you know, we want to show that we are terrible. We want to show that we hate you. So we go and we do this to your facility. They were super nice to say that they do it carefully not to impact any individual, who knows? Um, and we can't even verify if they actually did this or not because obviously it's, it's a bit obs more obscure to get this type of information. But you know, there is like, like the type of thing that it can happen from less sophisticated actors. This is another one. This is uh, Florida, um, Ultima, Florida, a case where uh, an attacker gained access to a water treatment facility. And basically what they did was modify the chemicals in the water so that uh, it, would, it would become basically dangerous for the, for the individual. The attacker wasn't very skillful. Uh, what they did wasn't you know, super calculated and whatever, but they got access and literally they modify the chemicals up to the top, which means that obviously there are going to be alarms and there's going to be people looking at what's going on, but the attacker wasn't aware of this. So very quickly, the operator fixed it. No one died, no problem. But just for the fun of figuring out what could have happened, uh, we have this exercise, this is a chemistry exercise for students in, in college based on this, that what it said is like, let's calculate what happened with the pH uh, of the water if this had succeeded. And basically it moves from, uh, from around the, I believe it should be around here, like seven, nine that you can drink. It was all the way to 13. So what, you, what can happen to your, your, your stomach if that happens, basically uh, I encourage you to look for it in Google if you don't want to sleep tonight. It's really horrible. But uh, it just, it basically can be super damaging for, for, for an individual. But the point is, when you go with these actors that are not as you know, experienced and whatever, it doesn't have to be that serious. We also have a couple, a couple of fun stories. Um, and this is the first one. I don't know if anyone here is familiar with, if I say a gas system and I ask, is anyone here familiar with what a gas system is? I'm glad because who knows, right? I mean, a gas system could be whatever. Uh, well, these guys just polished this and they said, we compromised this gas system 
in uh, Israel, and it is because uh, we basically hate them, whatever they are doing to my people, whatnot. And then uh, we're going to make we're, we're going to make everything burn. We started looking at this, and what we did was a different approach. It's just look what is it that they actually had access to, because it's it's very relevant if they are actually doing it. Um, by looking a bit into this, it was very funny, but we just started looking at some keywords like dumpers. I don't know if anyone, dumpers system or damper, or we started looking also for the IP, more or less the location, things like that. And basically, it turned out to be a kitchen. This was a kitchen appliance. It was basically, you know, HVAC for a kitchen. Uh, but, you know, I mean, it's interesting that they are getting access to these things, but also, you know, gladly it's not so simple yet. A second case was this one, which is an actor saying, I have access to a rail system from Germany, which sounds fairly concerning. But then when we go and look into it, basically by doing a reverse image look up into this, it turned out to be a model train, a toy. Uh, it sounded very concerning, obviously. It wasn't. It's interesting that it was connected to the internet. They could have you know, modified the toy train, but definitely much less concerning, more like an interesting story. And then the last case that I have for this one is a uh, refinery. Uh, these groups just drop these uh, uh, interfaces, and then they drop basically the list of what the service is, what is it that they are doing. What they do is they look for this protocol B and C, they look what panels are controlled, and basically they say we have a refinery. So of course we go and validate, and the refinery was a pig feeder. Uh, well, you can choose your animal, it's also for horses and whatnot, but basically much more simple than it could have been. So the point with this, third, with this third set of stories is more about the fact that there are actors actually learning about this. While this is not very impactful most of the times, probably in the first one, not on the others, there is people that is trying to learn how to do this that does not require as many resources as a nation state or as a criminal, and in the end, that's how they've begun. Uh, there's actually another report that we have from, from a nation state asking for information, a full research from a consultancy of, of how do you do this type of minor attacks, uh, which also shows basically, you know, like, like this uh, appetite for learning how to do them. But that being said, um, those were the stories in general, like, like to share a bit of what we're seeing from the physical world, from this connection, the type of threats, uh, type of concerns we are, we are sharing, the type of things we want to encourage you to go and, and, and also look into. Um, but just to discuss the, the high level implications, like what does this mean? What we want to take home is, first of all, uh, on, on a high level, where is this coming from? Um, for many years, it, there, we, we have had this, this uh, idea that technology is um, Basically, the more we incorporate computers, the more we incorporate clever things, the more we make things smart and whatnot, uh, you know, the best we're going we're gonna to be a society, the more problems we're going to solve. Uh, this goes in hand, for example, for with uh, like, like United Nations pushes all these uh, theories on detail inclusion. Let's get everyone to a computer, then everyone's going to live better and whatnot. All of this is true. It's perfectly true. But the problem is that we should also be considering about what might be the implications. When you connect these computers to the physical processes that before used to run, you know, directly from, from, from an engineering uh, uh, perspective, then you need to start thinking about what are the implications. And then we need to also start thinking about different ways in which we can make these, these connections clever because it is going to happen, the vendors are going to do it, but we need to think actually what are the implications and what can we do about it. And that is, you know, where, where, where there's our role. If we don't do that, which is the reason why I bring also the scary cases, well, several things can happen uh, because there is interest from states, from criminals, and from random people to try to play with these systems that control physical processes. And sometimes, as you saw, it can be model train, it can be jury hitting, it can be something, you know, very, very small, arguably, but it can also be something extremely concerning, like in the case of these energy facilities, like in the case of a water facility, like. Those are things that basically you do not want people messing up with, be it state, be it individual, be it crime. And that's something that is not really being as explored as it should. And the final thing is uh, there is definitely a lot of interest in trying to stop this type of activity, but where I'm seeing it the most, uh, where I'm seeing the most interest is at different levels, more like, like at big organizations, governments and whatnot, that they say we should stop filter your favorite nation state, your favorite organization, 
from developing attacks for physical infrastructure. But I do not see actually, uh, you know, from more on the individual community, how are we going to solve this type of challenge? What ideas do we have? How can we bring this into the, into, into the community, you know, beyond of this high level government type of, of perspective? And that is the reason why, uh, yeah, just to wrap up and finish this presentation, the last thing I have is uh, what you can do, what I'm encouraging, what I'm asking for to make it very clear is, uh, first of all, I share this just out of interest. It's, it has been very interesting to learn about all these things, actually build a lot of that. Uh, there's very few people that start getting visibility into this until it gets public. All of this is public and verifiable. Um, but I mean, uh, it has been also very interesting and then it's very nice to share it, but also we definitely want to get more people involved. We definitely want your interest. If you're working with uh, web security, well, what about thinking about web security for industrial controllers? Like, would you be willing to play with us for a bit and, and see how we can make those work better? If you're playing with, you know, basically whatever you're playing with, I think that if you have a bit of uh, knowledge in this area, if you're curious, if you want to start playing, we would definitely love it. And yeah, you know, basically it's, it's an open field. There's a lot of people involved in it. And yeah, that's uh, all on my side. Uh, thanks for everything. I bring this back up. Well, thank you, Daniel, for this amazing talk. It was super interesting. I learned so many new things. If anyone has any questions, there are microphones in the path in the middle. So if you have any questions, walk up to those and Daniel can answer them. Two questions. One, is this microphone on? Yes, it is. Yeah, thank you. Have you read at least the intro to Red Storm Rising by Tom Clancy? Did no, no, not really. I recommend that you read it because that really sets out the path to this whole thing. Okay. Well, so, what was the name to, to share the recommendation? Because the microphone is a bit low. Aha, it's not working. Um, Red Storm Rising by Tom Clancy. Okay, recommendation to read uh, Red Storm Rising. Rising. Uh, apparently, it's a, a very good for this. And also, to return with another one, there's another one called Sandworm. Uh, Sandworm, the, the, the book. It's also very interesting, very good. It's not really cyber physical, but it includes some big sections of how this began and, and, and whatnot. But also, yeah, thanks for the recommendation. I'm definitely going to go for it. Thanks for the recommendation. If anyone has any questions, no? Well, then give another big applause for Daniel. Thank you.